second, looks a lot better than I do, and our lovely guest who also, I'll, I'll go ahead and say he looks better than I do, Eric Asimov and Tara O'Leary. We're bringing you, and hopefully an internet first, I think it's internet first anyway, we've got uh, a wine show that's specifically going to be about geeky wine insider baseball, and you know, the hell with all the people telling me that they're that we get too far into the geekiness in wine. This show is actually going to be embracing that geekiness because the folks on here are geeks. And uh, the internet first part about this is that we've got co-hosts that span an entire ocean. So let me introduce myself very quickly. I'm Joe Roberts. A lot of people tuning in probably at least know my name or my annoying face. And I'm the guy behind OneWineDude.com and uh, the wine column at Playboy.com. My co-host in London, I'm coming to you from Philly, all the way over, Sister City London, is Tara O'Leary. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for being with us for our very first episode of The Punchdown. We couldn't be more excited. Um, and uh, as Joe said, you know, this is, we are hoping, uh, a first. And with this show, we're really hoping to bring you lots of really interesting, fun, and possibly funny, uh, I'll leave that bit to Joe, uh, content and, and talk about the wine industry. And so we're going to have fabulous guests with us and we are absolutely thrilled that our very first guest is someone you must know of, you've read his column before, he's been working for the New York Times since 1984 and he took over the very posh position of chief wine critic of the New York Times in 2004 and uh, please everyone welcome Eric Asimov, thank you so much. Hey Tara, hey Joe, pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, Joe. Uh, Joe. Yeah, there we go. You're, you're uh, welcome. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Joe. You're <laughs> awesome. Eric, thank you so much for being with us. And we're excited to talk about your, your new book here, How to Love Wine. So we've got memoir lots of questions for you. A manifesto. A memoir and a manifesto, exactly. So, Joe, you want to kick it off? I do. I, uh, thank you so much, Eric, for, for joining us. Uh, on this, we're all cooped inside in this amazing day. I know, in, at least in in Philly and New York, it's like seventy degrees outside. Not so, so much over here, by the way. <laughs> yeah, pretty yeah. Philly in the in London, UK. <laughs> so, so thank you, Eric. To I know you you'd rather work on your tan, but I appreciate it's you coming raining in. Raining here, Joe. It's raining. Yeah. Oh man. Or it was. Well, you Jets fans have this cloud. <laughs> right over your heads right now, just dumping down wherever it Please follows you. Find me. I'm going to pull out the bag and put it over my head. <laughs> they need that guy back, I heard. So, Eric, uh, you've got a, a new book, How to Love Wine, and uh, I, I really enjoyed it. I would describe it as thought-provoking, uh, particularly the manifesto piece. So the memoir, of course, explains, I guess, in a lot of ways, how you got your gig at the New York Times uh, as chief and only wine critic. And um, the manifesto piece, you, you go into quite a bit of detail about what you call the tyranny of the tasting note. That really resonated with me. It was why I wanted you to be the first guy on here, a nice a controversial topic uh, from a smart, opinionated guy uh, so that a probably opinionated but not so smart guy who's also into wine could talk to you about that. Um, I, the, the first question I have for you, though, before we get into the tyranny of the tasting note is... Do you ever walk around Manhattan with a flak jacket on because you're afraid of all the wannabe wine writers who might want to take you out to try and take your job at the New York Times? You know, I, I have a better plan. I, I just make friends with them all. I mean, they're, they're, they're great people. and, and uh, He's obviously not much like you then, Joe, huh? One of these days, somebody is going to take over, and I hope it's a good person. Man, what a measured response. You're going to need to get tougher for the show, man. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but you're tough. I mean, you know, you, in, in your defense of your tasting of piece, which I'll ask you to explain in a second, uh, you take a few people to task, you know, I think uh, po folks that have been uh, critical of your stance on tasting notes, uh, you even pull out a few uh, tasting notes. I think uh, one of Jay Miller's, Molesworth, you talk a, a bit about Alder Yarrow, who had some things to say about your um, your approach to tasting notes. And I just figured because you know uh, martial arts, you figured what the hell I'll name names. You're like, you're ready, you know, to, to take them on. Well, you know, let me be clear. Uh, nothing that I say in the book is, is personally directed at, at any of these people. Um, I mean, they're just, uh, you know, Alder's a friend of mine. He just doesn't disagree. He doesn't agree with me. And, um, and, and his arguments 
against my position were cogent, so I, I gave them as an example and, and then effectively rebutted him. Um, but, you know, it, so, it, doesn't, it didn't have to be James Molesworth or, or uh, Jay Miller or, or anybody. You know, it, the, the tasting note um, mode is, is, is uh, rampant throughout the wine industry, and those were just good examples to cite. Well, you say that um, at best, tasting notes are a waste of time, and at, uh, at worst, they're pernicious. So tell us give, us, give us your impression of tasting notes. Yeah, um, well, the reason I got on tasting notes in the first place was because um, ever since I've, I've been writing about wine, people come up to me all the time, and I'm sure, uh, Joe and Tara, you have this experience as well. Uh, people say, oh, I really like wine, but I, I don't know anything about it. I don't get all those aromas and flavors. I know I should, but I keep trying, and I just don't, I, it doesn't work. And, uh, and then their conclusion is that they're just lacking in, in something. So uh, I started thinking about how our culture talks about wine, thinks about wine, writes about wine. And, and foremost there is the, this, this form known as the tasting note in which we try to, to nail down a glass of wine in as many uh, uh, aromas and flavors as possible. So the first question is, why? Why do we do that? And um, uh, Aldo Yaro, for example, said, well, we do that because we want to know what wine smells like and we want to know what it tastes like, which, you know, seems pretty self-explanatory. Um, and my question, though, is, is that really helpful in understanding a, a, a glass of wine? Um, well, has anybody there ever made a decision about uh, a glass? Oh, I, I've read it, that one tastes a little too much like uh, like berry and not enough like cherry. Or there's too much uh, boysenberry, not enough lingonberry. I'm going to shy <laughs> away. No, it doesn't but, really affect uh, how we think about the wine unless you're using something that's that's derogatory in, in as an example. Well, no, you're absolutely right, and I think that, you know, most of the time, though, it's not when we've got the wine in our glass that we're thinking about the tasting note, unless, you know, it's like us where we're at a tasting and we're making tasting notes, but I think, mo for the most part, the average wine drinker is reading the, the tasting notes on the back of a bottle or on a wine list, and they're trying to use that to help them know whether or not they're going to like that wine, but I agree with you. I I think that, you know, the way that we talk about wine um, needs to change. It, you know, my opinion, my uh, impression of a strawberry may be different to yours and you know all these things I think we need to find a, a better way of talking about it and so my question my burning question to you which I, I'm sure I'm not alone in is uh, how do we how do we change the dialogue how do we how do we have a better conversation with the consumer Tara uh, I would say that um, you know tasting notes uh, are, are reflect a larger problem and that is the the whole um, Consumer, appro consumer reports approach to judging wines where you would line up, you know, a hundred glasses before lunch and, and try to assess these wines in a minute or two in the clinical environment of the tasting room. And that's a, 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 an environment that's completely removed from um, where anybody would normally drink wine. Exactly. And it also completely ignores the question of context, which is probably the most uh, important uh, uh, influence on how we experience a wine. Um, so, you know, when you're when you're writing tasting notes, when you're taking scores, when you're judging wine one among any, when you're trying to freeze a, 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 a single moment in that wine, I, I think it does a disservice to to good wines. Um, and we all know that good wines, they, they change in the bottle over time, they change in the glass over, over time, they change depending on, on what you're eating, who you're with, what your mood is, what the weather is. There, there are so many variables there. Um, so I think what would really be important is to simplify 
what is meaningful to consumers. And by the way, if you're a consumer reading the tasting notes on the back label of a, of a bottle, you're lost anyway. I mean, you as well <laughs> just take the, the advertising and mainline it into your veins. Yeah, exactly. A little bit of marketing going on on those labels there. But uh, I know that uh, Joe and I have had a discussion about this before. And Joe, you like to know that there's going to be some boysenberry in your yeah. wine. You know, <laughs> it's mulberry. Come on now. Oh, it's, God. I knew it was one of those berries. Or what was the one you, we, we picked on the book a bit, Eric? A matter of tobacco, which I, I don't know what that is either. But well, nobody, you know nobody knows what that is. And it's the, the funny thing <laughs> is when you, when you start reading particular writers and you read their tasting notes, the same references come up time and time again. Guilty. And, and, and Pithy. Pithy's mine. I use it all the time whenever I, I get that citrus pit. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think wine no tasting notes are useful when writing notes for oneself. You know, if I want to remember something about a wine and I write a tasting note, I know how to translate my own tasting notes and, and that's going to uh, spike a, a, a memory and I'll have a better idea of that wine. But if you're writing about, um, you know, melted fig compote and Maduro tobacco and, and whatever, it's meaningless to, to most consumers. And if you, taste, if you have the same wine and you give it to multiple critics and read their tasting notes, they're often completely different in their particular references. But what's important, um, what would be important in a tasting note in a tasting note is to do it in a much more general way. Uh, there are certain things that differentiate genres of wine and I once wrote a column that was basically intended to be uh, provocative and, and it was that said tasting notes tasting notes should have only uh, one word in it either sweet or savory. Um, and, and savory referring to the, the nexus of wines that, are, that don't derive their flavors from fruit so much. And sweet being fruit-based wines, not like uh, uh, residual sugar wines, but, but basically wines that, that have sweet fruit flavors. Well, just playing devil's advocate here, Eric. Yeah. So, and look, I agree with you that sticking uh, a rating on a wine and freezing in time is a bit of a ridiculous activity. I, I do it myself, and it's the least favorite aspect of any of the wine stuff that I do for me, okay? And I certainly wouldn't do it with Playboy Playmates or something. You know, like, well, she's like an 87, and she, I mean, you just... Oh, come on, It doesn't make maybe, any sense. Maybe, maybe you would. <laughs> no, I wouldn't go there. Our audience wants to know that you write for Playboy, right? <laughs> yeah, playboy.com, yes. But, so it's hard, to, it's hard to shove me under the mattress if you're reading my stuff, unless it's on an iPad, because I'm just on online. No, I, I think I but think I, at Playboy they want you on top of the mattress. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so plain devil's advocate though, can don't you think we can get general enough? I mean, I'm going to sound like um, our vice president Joe Biden here. I'm a, I grew up in Delaware, so I'm a bit of a homer with that guy. But I'm not trying to make fun of him. But you know, wine tastes like stuff. You know, it smells like stuff. Now I agree that when we start getting really specific, it gets out of whack for a lot of people. But I, I guess I've always kind of felt that there, there should be a middle ground. I mean, yes, it's, it's great if I know wine is a lot more like the unbearable lightness of being than it is, you know, some plotting, you know, war film or something, right? But at the same time, I may really not like black pepper. I may hate it. And if that's not if – if a wine is just like exploding with black pepper notes to the point where just about everybody you give it to is going to go, yeah, I smell pepper in that. I mean, isn't that a, something important for somebody to know potentially? Well, I, I, I don't know. First of all, can you distinguish between uh, black pepper notes and white pepper notes? And, and well, no, let's just go. Let's pepper. just go pepper. Let's just say pepper, right? Peppery. You know, and then what does – what pepper is a reference – I mean, if you say that people who – our, our connoisseurs of tasting notes might go to a, uh, a wine from the Northern Rhone, okay? And, and you'd say this is a, um, you know, a ver very uh, traditional styled uh, Northern Rhone Syrah wine, okay? 
well, why can't you just say that? Why do you have to, uh, you know, why speak in code? Why, why? Well, the only, the only thing about that is that maybe, you know, maybe some people don't know the style, you know, if they're just, if they're just beginning uh, their love affair with wine, they may not know yeah. Uh, what what that is, and well, and by the way, I just I just want to sorry, Eric, just one second. I just want to jump in and tell our the people that are watching. We'd love to hear your comments and have your questions, and you can send those to us on Twitter with the hashtag the punchdown, or you can send us an email to the punchdown at gmail dot com, uh, and we'd love to hear we'd love to hear what you have to say and if you have questions for Eric. But sorry, Eric, then to go to go back, you know, like I say, some people don't know the styles of the the specific regions, but then again, maybe it's more about telling the story so they. Do understand more about those regions. So you tell a story about the producer and the history and the and the place, and maybe that's more helpful. What do you think about that? Well, I, I believe that is that's the direction we ought to be heading because um, you know I'll I'll, t I'll say this about our approach with the tasting notes and the scores and the consumer reports, sort of listing of, of hundreds of, of of wines and 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 the idea of blind tasting. Um, also, you know, it's, it's really an effort to sever a wine from the, the place it came from, the people who made it, uh, and the culture it represents. Um, and it also, more than that, is an effort to assert our own human mastery over that glass. Um, when you're when you're taking a, when you exactly when you're when you're cutting a wine off from its heritage. Um, you're basically saying that you know what I'm gonna I can just I can describe this wine. You're you're demystifying it, which is a phrase that that a lot of American wine writer, writers love. You're saying uh, I I can boil it down to these aromas and these flavors, and this is when you should drink it. This is how it's going to behave. There, therefore, I own that wine. I, I kind of subscribe to Terry Thies's notion of remystifying wines. I think that uh, wine has does a lot of things that we don't quite understand. It behaves in ways that that are not necessarily predictable, and that's part of the the beauty of wine. And and it's even more beautiful when we know about the the culture that it represents, the people who made it, and uh, where it came from, and what perhaps other wines are like. Um, exactly. Now, yeah, I, I, unfortunately, that's not something that can be done in the, the mass way. You can't gather, uh, you know, hundreds of wines and, and summarize them in 12 pages in the back of the magazine that way. Right. You know, so, and, and it, and... Or on the back label. Or on the back label. Or on... On or, a wine list. And you can't put a number there to use as a crutch. So, I mean, I completely understand why consumers look to scores and, and perhaps even uh, want to feel that tasting notes are, are helpful. But I think that as, as wine consumers get more educated, they, they move beyond that and they do focus more on the, the culture of wine uh, the people, the history, rather than um, tasting notes, scores, and technical details. Yeah, no, I, I think, you know, great point. And um, I just wanted to bring up something, um, and I'm going to read it, because uh, it's from Henry Jeffries, the uh, review of your book. Henry Jeffries writes for The Guardian over here in the UK. And um, if I may just read a portion of his review to you, he says, um, I think, and this is Henry speaking, I think Parker et al. would be the first to admit how limited tasting notes and scores are at describing something as intangible and beautiful as the smell as of a Chambon Moussini. I very much doubt that, and here he puts quotes, that they believe the soul of the wine can be best expressed in scores and tasting notes, end quote, as Asimov claims they do. What's your reaction to that? Um, well, you know, for one thing, uh, I, most most anybody who uses the hundred point scale always offers the proviso, but don't but the, don't give too much importance to the scores. Just read the tasting note, read the description. So I, I would take issue with that. Um, it may be that uh, in their heart of hearts, they do know that that the scores and tasting notes are are not meaningful. But um, you know, then then you have to sort of examine the uh, hypocrisy of it all. 
And by that, do you mean the same people aren't really doing anything to stem the use uh, and proliferation of those scores in the markets and in marketing and advertising? Absolutely. I mean, if, it, if it's not meaningful, why give it such prominence? Do yeah, I, think I can't go into, you know, I'm not sure I want to go into the, the soul of, of Robert Parker or any, uh, you know, wine. I do. But, <laughs> uh, you know, I, and I appreciated uh, that, that thoughtful review, although I have, I confess I didn't agree with all of its points. Um, That's all right. <laughs> but I, you know, I, I do. I do think it's taking a leap for for that reviewer to to tell us what Parker really thinks. I mean, how do we know? Yeah, I mean, good, very good point. Um, I, I, that's been a, actually kind of a criticism I've had. I, look, and I think scores had their place. Scores absolutely had a place. I mean, a lot of bad wine was being made when folks started essentially saying, look, if we got to take the context away from this because people are just buying stuff based on some of that context when the product isn't very good. Now, we are way beyond that spot now, in my view. Uh, I know we're now we're getting, kind of getting into scores, but you know, it, it, I, I do have a question. So, Eric, you, you've got a, a differing now view of what the tasting notes ought to be, what, how, do, how we should summarize the wine. So who's doing it well? Like, do you have anybody out there that you're saying, you know what, I like what this guy or this girl is doing and how they're summarizing up the wine world? Jet Roberts. <laughs> Excuse me. Wine well, no. <laughs> You know, um, I, there are, are many wine writers who I think are terrific and, and whose main focus isn't the, the score and the tasting note. Um, you know, Matt Kramer, for one, of, of uh, Wine Spectator, and their new blogger, uh, Talia, Talia Bioki, is, is a terrific writer. Um, you know, Jay McInerney can be uh, really interesting, uh, go overseas, and, uh, I mean, you know, Hugh Johnson is, is kind of my wine writing hero. Um, but look at look at uh, other books. Oh, and let me not forget one of the the greatest American wine writers, John Bonet of of the uh, San Francisco Chronicle. Um, people who who put wine in the context of culture, I think, do a a great uh, job in inspiring people to want to explore wine. Uh, people like Robert Camuto, who wrote the, the wonderful book about uh, Sicily, uh, telling the story of Sicilian culture through the wine, Palmento, that uh, I believe came out last year. Um, and I, I have to admit that it, it galls me a little bit that there have been uh, great books written by wine merchants like uh, Kermit Lynch and, and um, uh, Terry Thies. You know, Rosenthal and Terry Thies. Yeah, they just... You know, they do this in their spare time while us professional writers are struggling to, to you know, churn something out. So, Eric, um, we actually have a, a question from the Twitterverse. Um, this comes from Todd, and he has an impossible last name, so Todd, forgive me, but uh, his Twitter handle is VT Wine Media. And um, so Todd asks, uh, many consumers are flavor-centric, not place-centric. So tasting notes may be the gateway to the latter story? Um, I, I don't think they're flavor-centric uh, at the level of specificity that, uh, that tasting notes go. I think they um, think of wine in, in larger terms, um, fruity, um, you know, tannic stay away, um, uh, astringent, tart, uh, mm -hmm. beginning wine drinkers don't like that, at, at least in, in this country. Um, I, I really don't think that they're looking for the kind of layer of detail that, that many tasting notes offer to us. And if, they, and if you think they are, you should talk to a few consumers and get them to uh, define what what they think any of these terms mean, and you'll come up with many, many uh, different answers. And, 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 and many people will say, "Oh, I can't. I don't really get that anyway." 
Yeah, and no, it's so, it's so true. There are so many notes and tasting notes none of us have ever tasted. Um, and I, I mean, for me, I always find that it's much more helpful when they put it in the context of, you know, drink this wine with this food or, you know, drink it as an aperitif or you really need food with, you know, whatever it is. I think that's more helpful for the average consumer. Um, and, uh, and I just think there's, there's, Yes, you know, some flavor style. I know Joe jo likes a, a few uh, flavor references, but I think, you know, there are other ways of talking about drinking wine in an everyday context that can be more helpful for, for uh, the everyday wine drinker. I, I'm going to say something else. Um, you know, there's, there's a sort of an illusion uh, in wine that, that all wine out there is the same and can be and ought to be judged on the same level playing field. And I don't think that's true. I don't think that's true any more than, uh, you know, if you think about food. I think most people who are discerning know how to separate um, fast food restaurants and franchise restaurants that kind of churn, churn it out according to, a, a, to focus groups and, and flavor profiles that they're aiming for. Uh, they know how to separate places like that with serious restaurants where where the food expresses a chef's point of view. And um, I, don't, I don't think we make that same leap to wine where the great mass of wine, as, as with food, is sort of a, a mass market kind of uh, product, a commodity that, you know, is, is probably sound and you might prefer one style over another, but most of those you know, don't have a whole lot of uh, difference. I mean, when's the, you know, the last time it, does it really matter to you sitting back there in the, in, in the coach section of the airline when they offer you that little screw, that little bottle, <laughs> you know, who made it and what the tasting notes are? No, they're pretty much all the same. Um, but good wine, that does express a point of view um, and, and a place is a different thing. And um, those sorts of wines, I think, just des deserve more discussion than, than the uh, quick note and, and score. Well said, well said. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, the, all, the, all the folks you brought up there, they're all, these are all folks who are going more in depth. I mean, they're all folks who are, they're, they're trying to tease out story. Um, rather than presentation of fruit or characteristics. Well, they, you know, they're also doing something that maybe, uh, you know, their, their family has been involved in for uh, centuries, um, although that's not a necessary thing. I mean, you've got great expressions of, of what I consider uh, cultural expressions of wine in, in the U.S., and we don't have that centuries-old uh, uh, wine heritage. But, you know, the, this attempt to, to express something deeper rather than simply to, to shape, to create a product for a perceived audience, I think is a divide in, in the wine world that we ought to recognize. Yeah, no, I think, you know, you've, you've hit on some really, you know, I, I think most of the, the topics that we as wine people talk about all the time and, and you know, it makes a lot of sense. And, and one of the things that I really liked in the book is that you talk about how wine drinkers can, can learn and you talk about your, your home wine school. Tell us a little bit about, about that. Well, you know, one of the, um, the things I learned as a sort of a novice wine drinker trying to learn more is that maybe... Uh, wine classes are are not really designed to help you that much. Uh, the The overall theme of my book is that our wine culture conveys the idea that in order to to simply enjoy wine, you have to know everything about it. You have to, in, in effect, become a connoisseur first. And m in my position is that that's a a backwards formulation. Before yeah. I don't do that with mustard. I mean, uh, well, <laughs> before you, before you want to learn about wine, you've got to see if you have an emotional attachment to to it. Um, you you have to essentially fall in love with wine first, and there after that, if if you find that you love wine. Um, then learning about wine is, is something you want to plunge deep into it. You're compelled to do it. It's not an obligation. Uh, and that's why my, my book is called How to Love Wine. It's not 
it's not a how-to guide. The thought is, is just to to forge this emotional connection with it first. So my suggestion, if you want to learn about wine, is instead of uh, going out there looking for the best class to take right away or the one book to read, uh, is just see how you feel about wine. Find a good merchant, uh, and there are so many of them these days, uh, and ask that merchant to, to put together a mixed case. That's 12 bottles in a case, 12 different wines. Most important thing, give that merchant a, a budget because uh, <laughs> you, know, you don't want to spend more than, than you want. Go home, um, open a bottle, you know, dinner every night, twice a week, whatever feels comfortable uh, for you. And, um, and there's a little bit of work involved because you want to take some notes. Uh, how does that bottle make you feel? How does it go? How do you think it goes with the food? Um, anything else that comes to mind, write down the name of that, um, that wine. That's very important some, because we, none of us remember. That's where tasting notes come from in the first place. And, uh, Good idea to take a picture of the label. <laughs> yeah, well, okay, that's, yeah. that's the way we do it nowadays. You know, get out the, the smartphone and take a picture. And, um, you know, get, record this stuff. And you, the idea is to become comfortable with wine, become at, at ease with it. Uh, see if this is something that's interesting to you. Uh, go back to the merchant, give the, give the merchant the results of your, your first go around and do it again and, and pick a new mixed case based on those initial re results. And a lot of good comes with this, most of all, figuring out if, if wine is something that is, that is something that you want to plunge into because you love it, not because you don't want to embarrass yourself in front of your boss or, uh, or your date or something like that. <laughs> and for those, for those in Pennsylvania, like me, uh, to do this drive to Delaware or New Jersey. <laughs> well, actually, speaking sure of that, to NPA. We, um, we actually, speaking of that exact thing, we've got a, a, another question from Twitter for you, Eric. Um, okay. uh, the, I'm not sure who this one, hold on. Uh, it's from uh, Kyle. Kyle uh, Water Wine Press. Uh, right. <laughs> uh, and it says, uh, Eric, uh, you do support local wines in uh, in the New York Times. How can other how can the other forty six, i.e., Colorado, show the world that there is quality here too? Um, well, you know that's a a a, uh, a philosophical question and a practical question. Um, my my intent is not to support not specifically to support local winemakers, um, but when they make really good wines, then I, I'm, I'm thrilled to support them. And so that comes number one. Um, and so you have to drink a lot of wines that, that come from your, your area. Uh, I would like to taste more wines from around the U.S., but it's, it's not easy because... Um, you know, very few of those wines make it uh, outside of their local market. I, I, in New York here, I can't buy wines uh, from Michigan, for example, a region that, that I'm highly interested in. Uh, or I can't buy wines from Colorado, and I'd like to be able to explore those wines. I can't buy wines from British Columbia. So, uh, But you, know, you can buy wines from England. <laughs> uh, I, can buy, I can buy one wine from England. Uh, That's true. We need, we need to work on that. And, and I'm a big supporter of theirs as well. But, uh, you know, I think that the best way to support it is to, to find out if you like those wines first and then drink a lot of them and, and tell your friends. Excellent. Well, I think drink a lot of wine is the answer to everything, personally. <laughs> Cheers to that. Eric, we want to say thank you so, so much for being with us. You know, it's been absolutely fascinating listening to you, and Joe and I are just so chuffed and thrilled that you are here with us. And we're even more excited that you're going to hang out with us for a few more minutes as we uh, cover a few more topics. I do, especially if you'll explain the, the British expression chuffed. I've never quite gotten that. <laughs> <laughs> it means we're very, very happy. <laughs> I'd, love, I'd love to know the history of that one. But I, I've, had, I've had entire, I've had entire conversa slang conversations with Brits that uh, I've had no idea 
what they were t- I, I I once got subway directions in two but had no idea what the guy was telling me. He's like, right, no, no, nip up the wicker shoes in there, Joe. I, hey, I, wanka, I, are you wanka? Yeah. <laughs> you got tube directions, Joe. You didn't get subway directions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Nip up the wicker shims, Jackson Donut. There you are. I was like, yeah, what he said. Okay, bye. You didn't <laughs> understand that? Jeez, Joe, you got to come over here more often. <laughs> All those years of watching the Black Adder and it didn't help me. Man. Uh, anyway, so uh, again, thanks to Eric, and now we're gonna we're gonna talk about a few other uh, topics here with you guys, just to cover um, some things that have been happening on the Twitterverse and and basic um, current events here in Wine. There are a few very uh, interesting things happening just within the last few hours, but um, we want to talk about um, a, a little segment that we're thinking about doing. So you guys will have to let us know what you think. Called our favorite tweets. And um, I actually, my, mine was, it just jumped right out at me last week. Um, it was really easy to come up with this one. It was from Randall Graham, the brilliant Randall Graham. And he was talking about the fact that on the uh, top 100 list from Wine Spectator, there were no, uh, there were no burgundies. And, uh, and that really got my attention and, uh, and, and actually it started a whole conversation and comes to, come to find out that Bruce Sanderson, actually the senior editor of The Wine Spectator, came on and said, well, we have a Macon. So uh, I was really was fascinated 15, by... 15% alcohol? <laughs> oh, sorry. <I> <laughs> what are you trying to say, Joe? Nothing, nothing. <laughs> so uh, I just thought that was interesting and uh, it brings up the whole topic of lists and the top 100 and and Joe you've got one or two thoughts about this well yeah I mean I'm you know I'm completely out of touch with this list I mean Eric actually brought up something interesting and he was saying earlier you can't um, you can't get into uh, at least it's a lot more difficult to get in the context and, and the mystery magic of wine and fill 10 or 12 pages at the back of the magazine with recommendations but you know what I mean that I remember in my early nascent days of exploring wine, grabbing Wine Spectator, and looking, I think it was one of these, looking at a top 100 list, and I just had no idea what was going on. I, I mean, I couldn't, it, it, you know what it reminded me of was when you used to send away to get albums, you send like a penny, and they give you like 20 albums or something. <laughs> I remember Do you remember that. this, or CDs, or cassettes? And they would always like have a catalog that printed these little blurbs about each of the albums, and they, you know, the blurbs to me told me nothing about the albums. And that's kind of how I felt about the stuff in, in Spectator when I looked. And I said, this isn't the vehicle for me. Like, it's just, it's just not going to work. And, uh, and I, never, I never rectified that. I've never come back. You know, and I looked at some of the, the wines that listed, not that they were bad, but I know they had a, in the top 10, they have uh, a pretty good uh, Saltern that when I, Went as a 2009. When I went to the 2009 uh, tasting in New York, it was like my my tenth or twelfth, probably in terms of my you know my personal favorite of the Sauternes. I actually liked uh, Sudero a lot more. I liked Climon a lot more. I, I I just thought I'm I'm totally out of touch with this. Well, I, I confess I haven't seen the list yet. But, You're uh, even more out of touch than I am. Well, yeah. I Come haven't on. seen the list either because but, you have to be a subscriber. The question of of how um, you know what the purpose of these lists are. I mean, obviously, it's it's not to suggest that this is these are the hundred best wines in the world. There, there's a um, you know it, it generates discussion and marketing, and uh, you know then then there are are motives of, of politics and 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 so on that are not uh, obvious to to readers. So you know you have to take these lists with a, a grain of salt. I, I you know how how you could put together a, a list of a hundred top wines of the year or however you want to define them and 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 essentially ignore. Burgundy, I, I don't think that I could. I, it's hard to see how that's possible. Yeah. yeah. But. I mean, yeah. it's a, it's a little it's a little bizarre. I mean, well, you know, Burgundy's not in the list. The French are drinking less wine. Is there, oh. are less wine? The Brits are making good sparkling wine. You know, is, uh, is yeah. gravity still working? I'm not I, sure. I, I think hell just froze over. I'm pretty. I'm pretty sure. Pretty sure that's what just yeah, happened. The French have been drinking less wine for decades, so I, that's nothing new, really. But now they're drinking fizzy drinks and juice, whereas Middle America is drinking more wine over the last five years. Well, oh they, you know, but there's a that's a good question. I don't know that. Uh, well, 
let's not use the term middle America because, uh, you know, there, there are thriving wine cultures all over the country. But, you know, I, I think the figures show that, you know, a, a surprisingly small percentage of Americans account for like 95% of all the wine consumed in the U.S. So if you look at the, the per capita uh, consumption in the U.S., it's still way below the French and, and many other countries, even if we cumulatively drink more wine than, than they do. Yeah, We're, no, nobody's pulling into a gas station in the Midwest in Utah and ordering Cru Beaujolais, okay? Like they're not, so give me, how about a case of that Cru Beaujolais over there? That's not happening. It's not happening right not now. Not happening, no. But you are, Joe, you are single-handedly trying to, re <laughs> trying to rectify the fact that people are not drinking, you know, there are not just segments around the country that are, you know, everyone should be drinking wine, and it's, you know, it's you. You know, what, what's happening really is, is slowly it's becoming a, a global wine audience rather than a local wine audience. So, you know, everybody, you know, 100 years from now, if we're all still here, everybody will be drinking the same amount, uh, except in those, those cultures that prohibit alcohol. Uh, yeah, fair point. Yeah, it's and, we'll, and we'll have the United Federation of Planets and, and all will be well. <laughs> <laughs> to go with our frozen hell. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, though, the collector mark will take a nosedive because if you've got those replicator things and you're just like, I'm going to take an 82 Mouton and it just it just pops it in the little, you know, comes out of the little microwave device for you for nothing. I mean, that's going to totally collapse the auction market. Sorry. Got bad news for everybody. I'm gonna go click on the phone. <laughs> okay, so uh, while while Eric's uh, dealing with his phone, I want to talk about uh, what I'm drinking now. All right, do it. Eric's doing that. Okay. Because I, I pre-show, which everyone didn't see, I started sipping this and, so, oh, what is it? What do you got? What do you got? And uh, you know, I was recently asked to uh, go down to the wine, uh, the Argentine Wine Awards in 2013. Okay, so I'm going in February, I think. I'm actually I, I'm actually Team USA on this uh, on this panel, right? So of the judges, I'm the only US judge which is shows a surprising lack of judgment on the part of the organizers <laughs> of of this, uh, of this thing. But they want each of the international judges, okay, so there's folks from uh, I think South Korea, a couple from t the UK got two. I don't know how they managed that. The rest of everybody, everybody else got one. Uh, I think Hong Kong is in there. Canada. I mean, France. It's it's a, it's a great group. And they want each of us to do a short presentation. Okay, we're going to pick a wine that uh, exemplifies the attitude of the the newest generation of wine markers of, of wine uh, uh, drinkers in our markets. Okay, so I'm thinking you know, mid to younger millennials in this case, okay, just coming in. Like our intern, the young unpaid Shelby, who's running things behind the scenes here. So she's actually drinking this right now in my basement. She's, she's like, amazing, yes, because the young unpaid Shelby is locked in the basement. As, yeah. you know, <laughs> yeah. Joe, Joe likes to Don't keep read too much into that, okay? Hold on, hold on. And so <laughs> I, I picked a wine um, that, I picked this wine. I'll show you. So I'm drinking Terraquette. Oh yeah, classic. Wow, ten bucks. Okay, and it's got a coolness factor. Maybe Shelby, you might want to come on at this point to back me up on this. But you know, you've got you've got a bunch of the cognac grapes in here in this area of Gascon. So you've got um, Gros Montsang, Colombard. Uh, you've got Uni Blanc, right? So this is, I mean, ten bucks. It's good. It's refreshing. Pithy, which I love to say, but it is really pithy. Uh, you can drink it with food. You can drink it without food. It's still going to give you, you know, a lot of a lot of pop, a lot of zing. And sorry, Eric, for uh, uh, but I'm going to say it does have tropical fruits. Okay, I know you're. Uh, but it, it's very or useful words. It's lively though. It's a very lively wine, and it's inexpensive, right? And it's got the coolness factor. So there's Shelby, the young unpaid Shelby. She can go to her friends and say, "Well, you know, I've got this wine. It's like 11 bucks. It's got these grapes that you never heard of, but it kicks ass." And the interesting thing I think it's going to happen when I'm down there is this is everything that the art, art, that Torontes white is not <laughs> right now to me. So it's going to be interesting that, that we've got a whole generation of, you know, Shelby's potentially cutting their teeth on wines like this. Now, yeah, California wine's different. Torontes is different. I'm not saying they need to make classy, right? But what they need to do is they need to be thinking about how they're going to get somebody like Shelby looking at their wines when this is the kind of stuff that she knows and her first reaction to that 
stuff is going to be, wow, this is kind of big. Like, this is oily, or this is... Shelby, what would your first reaction to this wine be? Um, I really like it because, number one, it stands alone without food. And I know I drink way more wine without food than I do with a meal. I know. Oh, you're an unpaid intern. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Where, where yeah. do you do this? Yeah, but it's... Are you uh, in, bar, in bars or where? Um, no, I drink a lot at home. I have friends over to my apartment. We I grab a bottle, go to a friend's. Um, in my basement. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> in, jo in Joe's basement. Um, I don't order glasses of wine that much out at restaurants because I can go out and buy a bottle with what I would spend on that you know, on that one glass, and I'd rather learn about a, a bunch of different wines, but I'm different. I'm kind of like a wine geek for my age. Um, but I think this is like very, my friends would drink this and say, oh, it's like very acidic, like a Sauvignon Blanc. And I have friends that like Sauvignon Blanc now because it's not Pinot Grigio. It's not like the lemonade, like a lot of, you know, everyone's drinking when they first start drinking wine. So it's different. It's interesting, but it's, it's not too complex that they can't understand it or enjoy it. So I think... The, and I mean the price. Let's be honest. <laughs> yeah, ten bucks. And here's a question I think, and it's related to one we got on Twitter uh, from Katie Myers. Looks like hi, Katie. And she was asking about packaging. You know, does does packaging have an impact on consumers that reflect to what? And this maybe for both Eric, you and Shelby. I know Shelby was saying earlier she liked the packaging on this wine. It would actually catch her eye because it evokes. Is something that that is uniquely French, which is let's stick a chateau on it. But does it in a doesn't do it in a way that makes it look like every other uh, label on the shelf? I mean, I was just in Bordeaux, and we laughed at a lineup of about forty wines. It was they asked us why are we laughing? I said these all look like exactly the same label. I don't know why anybody would hope if they're next to each other in a store. To, to differentiate those if they have no idea about you as a producer. By the way, these guys did not pay to get on the show or anything. This just literally <laughs> happens to be the one I pulled out for this, but anyway. And it's a screw cap, which makes it easy if you go to a friend's house and they don't have an opener. So, like, exactly, exactly. Another... Well, uh, I like the I, packaging on that. I mean, it's very true to, to its place, but it's got the little, it's got the English word on it, classic. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it's it's not quite uh, at the level where it's sort of overtly um, uh, shaped and pitched at somebody like layer cake or you know sinful chocolate. Right. right. No fuzzy I mean, animals. I said that too. Yeah, I was like, it yeah, doesn't have any it's animals. Nice. It's not insulting. It's not an LOL, OMG, LMAO <laughs> wine like that insults my generation. So it's it's pleasant but it also makes you feel like you're an adult drinking and not like you had someone buy this for you you know so. totally well and and along, <laughs> along those lines my you'll have to give me your opinion but the the wine I I've chosen to drink tonight is um, is the sort of packaging that I usually go for in a wine shop it's um, it's very it's very clean and classic and you can understand everything and in fact it's got a very interesting term on the label so this is what I've been drinking this evening it's the Seven Springs Pinot Noir and I don't know if you can see it on there but it says it comes from young vines now this is from uh, from South Africa and it's actually made by a, a good friend of mine who is an English guy uh, Tim Pearson um, and uh, you probably know him he's all over the Twitter Twitterverse and social media, but um, he he lives here. He fell in love with South Africa with his wife many many years ago, and now he makes uh, his wines there. And this is my first time tasting his Pinot Noir. His Sauvignon Blanc has been out for a couple of years, but this is their very first vintage of this wine. And uh, and right, you know, you usually see if anything um, re relating to the vines on the label, you'll see old vines. But he has gone and put right on here. Young vines, which for a lot of us we'd be like, young vines. Yeah. You know? Well, usually mm -hmm. that's um, you know code for for their less expensive cuvee. Uh, Turley does that with Zinfandel. Yep. We call them the, the juvenile vines. So yeah. you can make a, a blend of the young vines that you don't want to put into your your main cuvees, um, but but often you know it's rare that you have that level of of specificity. Exactly, and it's rare. That, I mean, and 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 because this is his first Pinot Noir, honestly, it's. I mean, I don't know how well you can see the color here, but it's it's not. You know, it's it's just a beautiful color. It's not too light. It's not too robust. And in it's. You know, I'm just drinking it, obviously, 
by itself without food and it's perfect it's lovely and light the tannins are soft um, but I would say if I was going to give a tasting note I wouldn't talk about the strawberries and the earthiness or whatever I would just say that it's it's perfect to drink as I am chatting with friends uh, enjoying a social evening and uh, and you know it would go well with a, a nice risotto perhaps <laughs> I'm, I'm getting hungry <laughs> she, she fully bought in she's fully bought in on it Eric she's like you got her that's what happens when your friend is the winemaker. <laughs> well, yeah. it, yes. <laughs> I think we, you know, we should probably. Well, you know something? I'm, I'm actually serious about that because, um, you know, we, we all know that one of the most powerful marketing tool is if you feel you know the winemaker. And that's why uh, tasting rooms are, are, are such powerful tools because they bring people in and they invest them in the story of one particular wi uh, winery. And if you know the, the people, you, you know their family, you, you're, that's really part of the, the beauty of, of wine. And it, and it also you know, illustrates how, how our own minds work when we're uh, thinking about wine, if if we if we're in on it somehow, it's it's meaningful. It's an interesting point. I you know I am friends with uh, Ron Washam, the hose master of wine. Okay, who um, he he has a very interesting take on your book. He he claims he didn't read it, so he did a blind <laughs> book review, which is quite interesting. But um, you know, we had a conversation one night, and he said, you know, why don't you rate wines higher if the guy or girl making them is cool, and you know if they're real like a hole then deduct uh, ratings deduct All right. well there we go we've got our, we've got our new system <laughs> and I said, dude, this is like I mean it's uh, obviously it's kind of weird but it's also it really gets you thinking because that's how you approach it I, I know I, I recently talked to Rick Meyer who was a was an NFL r rookie quarterback sensation and when he left the NFL he started mirror wines in Napa and I talked to him for a thing I'm doing a playboy with um, wines for tailgating you know essentially was asking him a couple questions later on in, in the interview about uh, collecting wine he said I don't you know I don't like collect wine I, I like wines where I know the people and I visited or maybe I've, you know, I've gone to the vineyard or maybe it's associated with some something that happened in my life uh, and I said you know that's, that's a really interesting take I mean it's completely you know that's a whole part removed from the aspect of okay the wine scored such and such I'm going to hold on to this for sort of a, maybe an emotional and financial investment. And I, I've really found it resonated. That comment from him really resonated with me, thinking, you know, that's, that, that's, that's how we approach situations. Yeah, exactly. Well, I always find that, you know, whenever I, I visit anywhere and I go to the wineries, it just brings it all home, right? You know, I mean, you, you may have tasted the wine before, um, but when you're there and you're talking with them and you're hearing the stories and you're, you're smelling the air and you're walking the soils, that is when that is when wine really comes alive and that, that's what they're trying to put into these bottles and for us to experience at our own dinner tables. And but be I think careful, you're, all, you're also smelling the fertilizer. Uh, <laughs> I mean, well, yes. Yeah. I think that's as, as, as people who might be um, writing about wine, talking about wine, you know, you have to be cognizant of that so that you're not uh, giving into that yourself too often, yeah. Um, and of course, then there's the reverse. You know, there are always people who who uh, will give higher uh, uh, rank to wines made by bastards because they know they're that guy's not trying to sell me anything, and if I like his <laughs> wine, it must be good. There you go. Good point. <laughs> Well, listen, on, on that note, uh, on, on the bastard winemaker note, um, I, I think, um, you know, we should say uh, thank you again so much to Eric. Um, we are absolutely thrilled to have you, and thank you for all of your insights and, and comments. Um, it's been wonderful having you. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. I've really enjoyed this. Thank Great, you. thanks. And, uh, yeah, people, if you haven't checked it out, if you're, if you're getting geeky about wine, uh, I definitely recommend having to read. You might not agree with everything that's in there, but it will get you thinking. I think that's, that's the important part. That's the idea. Exactly. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you can have your home wine school and learn about wine around your own dinner table. And it's the lightest hardback I've ever felt. Yeah, what's up with that? I mean, this <laughs> no, thing is like... It's wasteful, get... it's elegant, it's, it's, it's <laughs> light but intense, just like everything I love in wine. I'm getting, I'm getting cardboard and... <laughs> oh, sorry. 
<laughs> and um, and for everyone watching, we thank you so so much for being here. We hope you've enjoyed it. Um, we would love for you to uh, leave us a comment below on our uh, Google Plus page for the punch down. Please let us know what you thought. Um, let us know uh, if you have any further questions for Eric. We'll be sure to pass them along. And also, uh, if you have any. Uh, recommendations for the next episode. Uh, hopefully we'll be bringing them to you once a month uh, and uh, we will soon be uh, letting you know who our next guest will be. But thank you all for being here. And um, don't forget to follow at Eric Asimov, at One Wine Dude, and I am at Tara underscore Devon because the wine passionista was taken. Anyway, uh, <laughs> thank you again, everyone, and to the wonderful young unpaid Shelby for all of her hard work. We congratulate you. Thank you. Thank you.